Good morning, everyone, or I suppose afternoon, depending on where you are. It's still morning for me. Thank you so much for joining us today on our uh, joint webinar. I am Gwen Preston of Resource Maven, and I'm joined, of course, today by Chad Peters of Ridgeline Minerals. So we're going to take turns uh, telling you some stories. I'm going to start with my outlook on the markets and, and how it's all uh, playing out, what's going on right now, what the forecast is, and, and how I think, uh, what what comments I'm giving to people who are wondering how to take advantage of the opportunity. And then I will hand the reins over to Chad who can start um, showing you what Ridgeline is up to right now. So precious metals. Um, obviously there's always a huge amount to say when it comes to discussing the gold silver markets. Uh, I'm gonna go through the fundamentals um, reasonably quickly. Uh, so that they don't take up the whole time. And then, like I said, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about how to take advantage of the opportunity. So the basic, the basic thing that I want you to walk away with is it's complicated. And that applies to whether you're talking about gold and silver and how they're trading today versus tomorrow. It also applies to them in a longer term time frame, how they move. And it applies to how to take advantage of gold, silver market opportunities. But gold in itself, there's it gets pushed and pulled by the same forces a lot of the time so for example when there's a flight to safety that should benefit gold but gold also gets hurt by us dollar strength which is the other thing that happens in a flight to safety gold usually thrives when there's economic uncertainty but it also gains when there's inflation which is the opposite usually um gold is thought to move against the stock market but it hasn't in these days it generally seems to move more with the market in these in the new macroeconomic and monetary world so one thing to take from that is that gold's first reaction to a major economic event often isn't its inherent reaction it often stems it's often influenced or comes from a bigger market such as the reaction to that event from the US dollar or from bond yields or from the stock market. And the reaction that makes sense for gold often happens after. So it takes a little while for gold's inherent reaction to develop. But at the end of the day, if time is on your side, you're not trying to trade your portfolio to a profit tomorrow or next week, but are looking more on you know, a normal investment timeline of, a, of several years to longer, the details don't actually matter. The big picture picture is that precious metals are going up from here. So here's the basics of the golden setup. Negative real rates are always the most important bull force for gold. When, intra when real interest rates are negative, that means it does not pay to hold dollar savings. And so safe money needs to put itself somewhere else. And gold becomes a classic um, destination for those savings. And importantly, we are very much in a negative real rate environment right now. And the Federal Reserve has assured us that we will remain there for years. I think that year's time, that year's comment um, deserves a little emphasis. It took the Federal Reserve seven years to raise interest rates following the great financial crisis. Now, I don't know if it's going to take seven years this time, but that sort of time frame is pertinent. I think it, it's relevant. It's going to take years for the Federal Reserve to work its way out of this setup. Powell has said so much himself when he repeats himself, but um, saying we're not even thinking about raising rates. He underlined that when he changed the inflation target to a 2% average instead of just to getting to 2%. Those are clear signs that the Fed is going to let inflation run and leave interest rates at zero. If interest rates are zero, then any inflation puts real rates in the negative territory. And so real rates are negative, will stay there and will likely get more negative ahead. Now, why are they going to get more negative ahead? Because the US dollar is facing structural challenges. So US dollar weakness had been helping or has helped during periods of gold strength in the last few years. Of course, we have most of the time been in a dollar bull paradigm, but I think there's reason to believe those bull days are done. Um, inflation expectations are clearly rising. They were a really strong part of the reason that gold went on such a run in July and August. It had to do with rising inflation expectations. That stems from money printing and all the stimulus being handed out. Um, it stems from uh, economic recovery. There's lots of reasons to have 
higher expectation inflation um, inflation expectations. So those, of course, weaken the dollar in themselves. They also help keep those real rates negative, which, remember, is the most important thing. Then there's other factors working against the US dollar, including China's con continuing efforts to reduce its reliance on the US dollar. That's a very long-term game, but it's happening. There's the ballooning money supply. There's the huge debt loads on both government and corporate sides. And there's the trade war. I mean, if the trade war, when the trade war is um, doing badly, like when signs are bad on the trade war front, then the US dollar has declined. So the US dollar, um, US dollar weakness can only help gold. And I think that that is a situation that is going to be more and more common as we go forward. Then there's the fact that those safe dollars that don't that need somewhere to go have very few options so if we go back to before the new monetary age you know that was sparked by the great financial crisis and all of the quantitative easing if we go back before that for many for decades huge pools of low risk capital always owned bonds bonds ge generated reliable yield and that was how they that was where those dollars sat they can't do that anymore bonds don't pay you um so instead all that low risk money has to be in the stock market. That is why we have had a bull stock market for the last decade and counting. And that's fine. I'm not gonna make any predictions about what's happening in the stock market. It may well continue up from here, but the risks are very real. And so that's the risk of a 10% slide. That's the risk of a crash. Um, the risks are very real. So safe money has to hedge itself. It doesn't have a choice. It has to hedge against that risk. And so, Gold is one of the very, very few options in creating that hedge. What I have up here are just some some slides that show some of those risks. I mean, you can see corporate bankruptcies were on track to be worse than 2009 and 2002. So, you know, it's not good. That's no surprise given COVID, but it's the risks are very real. Um, I also love this tweet. Imagine buying a bond that le yields less than inflation. So you have to pay to own it from an extremely leveraged company. So the underlying asset is at risk as well. That's the case today in the United States. So that's an example of how you can't hold bonds for yield at all. And so you need to go somewhere else for low risk um, to, to put your money in a low risk place or to hedge the risks that your money um, is exposed to. I also wanna just take a bit of a step back and look at some events going on in the world, some important forces right now. And I think it's it's interesting that gold probably does well no matter what happens. Um, that's a pretty fun statement to be able to make, actually. But I mean, take the US election, obviously a very important event that's sneaking up on us quickly here. If Biden wins, well, we probably get more benefits, more money printing, more debt, and that likely gives us inflation in a zero interest rate environment that is positive for gold. If Trump wins, well, then we get more of what we've had, which is whatever it takes to support the stock market and the economy, which probably means stimulus in a zero interest rate environment. That will also be good for gold. It will be inflation in a zero interest rate environment. It works the same for COVID. If we get a rise in cases, then we get a flight to safety in a zero interest rate environment. If we get a drop in cases, then we probably get growth-based inflation in that ZERP environment and the trade war the same. So I think um, gold works on specific macroeconomic levers, but it also works on sort of big picture event-based analysis. Okay, so if everything's set up so well, why did we have this recent dip? Why has gold struggled a little bit um, in the last month? Well, the key event is that Justice Ginsburg died and what that meant that the stimulus package that the markets had already priced in evaporated because it needed bipartisan support and all of that um, disintegrated in the face of the Supreme Court um, fight. And so when we lost that stimulus package, then inflation expectations, remember I said in rising inflation expectations were a big part of the reason that gold went on a run in July, in July and August. Those inflation expectations dipped because they had more recently become predicated on another stimulus package. And so inflation expectations dipped and the market had a fit just in general. And so the result of that is that gold sold off with everything else, gold, the metal and gold, the miners. At the same time, we had a flight to the US dollar in reaction to that lack of stimulus. So there's gold 
getting hurt as a proxy to another market, which is what I said at the beginning. And um, the flight to the US dollar was exaggerated by the fact that the euro turned down because COVID, the COVID uh, case count, especially in mid-September, was rising specific, like rising predominantly in Europe. And then there's also just a bit of a time of year thing, which is that September is when a lot of portfolio rethinking happens because traders come back after the holidays and it's not surprising to see some profit taking in arenas that have done well and gold certainly fits that description. I'll just go through this very quickly. One factor that had that added very much to the run in gold and silver prices um, through the summer and then to their downside when they turned is uh, a lot of speculative positioning in China. Um, I could talk about this for 20 minutes, but I won't. Instead, I'll talk about it in about one minute. Basically, there was a lot of easy money available in China and a lot of that money went to, in a similar vein that we had the Robin Hood trading phenomenon here in uh, North America, over in China, a lot of it ended up being um, inexperienced traders betting on gold and silver futures. And that is a super fun game when gold and silver prices are rising because you get multiples, like you make a lot of money um, without having to put down a lot of money in a very short period of time. And so that's great until the prices turn down. And then guess what? Leverage cuts both ways. And so all of your money evaporates very quickly. So the ramp up of that speculative action in China really um, fed into gold and silver price gains. And then when the prices turned, a lot of those investors had to scramble to cover and then exited their positions completely. They stopped playing the game. Um, net, right now, we're in a period of time where the Chinese markets are closed for, uh, for some back to back holidays. And so a lot of those short term or inexperienced traders closed their positions ahead of this market um, quiet period and long-termers will actually have to chase their positions if um, if they've bet wrong when they come back. So if the prices have gained and they had down position, they had down bets, they'll have to chase when they come back in a few days. So I think that just amplified both the upside and the downside, um, in particular the downside here recently. And it's likely going to be less dramatic going forward because they've those inexperienced traders have now realized that leverage cuts both ways. On the junior exploration front, um, it also hasn't been helping that we've been facing a free trading date landslide. A huge number of companies raised money in May through August. So there's a huge number of those financing shares coming free to trade now through the rest of the year. And those push back on share prices that have gained um, that's part of the game. That's part of how this process works, but it's certainly an important factor in the markets right now. If you're wondering why a stock that you're holding is sliding when there doesn't seem to be a reason, look back four months and see if there was a financing that closed four months ago that may be at play. Super slow assay labs are also a thing. I mean, this isn't targeting one company or another. This is targeting, this is hurting everyone. Assays are taking three months instead of six weeks. Um, that's very difficult for geologists. It's very difficult for management. It's very difficult for investors. It's just one of the things that's happening. And again, some profit taking. The run in July and August gave investors, some of whom were you know, dedicated through a lot of down years, the opportunity to take some profits off the table. And that's okay. That's also, that's why we're here, right? So that's also okay. But these are all the forces that are at play. Okay, so we have a bull market ahead. How are you going to profit? I want to go through this quite quickly because I really want to be able to get to Ridgeline and the opportunity that Chad's going to outline here and what's new with them. But I want to say that if you agree with me that we're in a position where for the next few years, gold and silver are going to do well, then the question is how do you, how should you best take advantage of that opportunity? And um, the comments that I always give are you don't have to be an expert. You do have to understand what's going on and decide that we're in a bull market, to watch the forces enough that you can see when that situation starts to change. I think that will take some time, like years, but that's part of part one and two go together. And then part three is you have to understand yourself as an investor. So decide how much time you want to commit to following stocks and following the forces, and then how much risk you can tolerate and when you answer those questions, then you can set expectations, you set goals and expectations for your portfolio that you're actually likely to meet. Um, if you don't ask yourself those questions, then you're likely to get frustrated, disappointed, and perhaps lose money because you'll be um, positioned inappropriately 
for what you actually want to do. But at the end of the day, whether you're a trader or an investor, whether you like to speculate on discovery or whether you like you know, to invest in leverage to a rising market, it all works. That's what's so great. Um, it just works with different timelines and different risks and different needs. Uh, the two charts I have show that GDX is up 56% year over year. That's fantastic. 56% is great. Evergold, I use as an example here. Sure, it was up 300%, which is great, even better, clearly. But that's only if you sold right at the top. And exploration speculation is often a roller coaster. So don't pretend that it isn't when you look at charts like that and wish that you had gotten in. Okay, if you're gonna bet on explorers, remember that it's risky. So one thing is a lot of companies raise money. I mentioned that before. All of that money is going into the ground. That's fantastic. More money into the ground, testing more targets means we are hearing about more discoveries. That doesn't mean that discoveries have gotten any easier. The odds of success on any one target remain what they always have been, which is not particularly good. Um, so don't see price charts like that Evergold chart or like any number of discovery price charts and um, let that make you think that it's easy, that you just need to buy an Explorer and it's gonna happen because it's not. It absolutely can happen. And if you wanna increase your odds of getting on the right course, then I think so there's a few particular things you need to do. One is that you need to demand that that company has more than one strong target or project. So targets within a project or multiple projects that they're testing. That's just an odds game, right? If you're gonna test more things, your odds of success on any one of them go up. You also need to demand that the company has very strong technical competence and rationale for why they own the projects, why the targets make sense, and why they are the right people to chase that theory. Um, there's, there's a lot of groups out there that flit around from project to area to commodity, and they're not experts. Those are not the teams that I bet on. I want strong technical expertise, and I want really deep rationale for why they're doing what they're doing. Because at the end of the day, they're doing it with my money if I'm a shareholder. And then you just want to remember that geology is risk enough. So ensure that management has the other risks reasonably well in hand. So permits for drilling, are they, are they, do they have them? Are they at least close? Is it in a jurisdiction that's functional? Um, is seasonality an issue? Are you going to be stuck in a through a many, many long winter months with no news flow? Or do they have a way of a, a second project that's in a, a different part of the world? Are there access or logistics challenges? Um, are they, do they have a plan up for marketing, a, a way to tell the story? Do they know how to play that game so that people know that the company exists? They're never gonna buy a story if they haven't heard about it. So those are the things to consider if you want to speculate on discovery. I obviously speculate on discovery a lot. I love doing it, but these are some of the demands that I make on my exploration speculations. I'll run through this very quickly. You don't wanna speculate on discovery. There's lots of low risk things that work too. There's large leverage like Barrick. There's mid tiers and majors that have good growth ahead. There's royalty companies that outperform miners in bull markets and bear markets. There's optionality, which are the big assets that become really in demand as a market gets established. They, they, they're hated when a market is in the bear trough, but they become very much in demand when the market gets hot. There's takeout targets. Remember silver because it usually outperforms gold in a precious metals market. So there's a lot of ways of building a low risk portfolio as well. And I can certainly talk to anybody about that more if they'd like. And then I think there's some stocks that fit the middle. So I talked about the explorers that are quite risky. You try to manage those risks, but you're gonna need to trade them to some extent because of free trade date pressures, because of speculation, because of discovery price moves, because of, um, failure to discover price moves, you're gonna to need to trade those. There's the big low risk plays that you buy and hold. And then I think there's some that sit nicely in the middle. And these are the ones where there's a good exploration upside, but there's also fundamental value. That means that you don't, it's not a roller coaster. It's likely more stable with um, opportunity or uh, good potential for nice upside. So I'd say companies that are moving their deposits towards initial mine plans, but are also doing significant exploration programs on um, 
other targets in the project area. And then there's companies, to be honest, like Ridgeline that have multiple projects. So if you have a strong lineup of exploration opportunities, that limits the downside because if hole number one or two or four doesn't work at project A, there's still project B, which is lined up, perhaps drills are already turning, and there's project C, and then there's another series of targets at project A that they'll move to once they've reassessed things. So if you have a strong portfolio of projects with good rationale and technical expertise, that puts you in what I'd call the sum trading middle ground, where there's good opportunity for some nice upside, but there's really fundamental value there that supports the stock along the way. And I've noted there that it certainly helps if the stock is well managed, which means the structure is tight and it's well held. The company has an awareness that they need to do some marketing. They've planned their programs to create consistent news. It's not seasonal, things like that. That's what I want to say today. Really, this is a choose your own adventure setup because there's this exciting few years ahead for gold and silver. Corrections like we're seeing right now are part of the process and that's okay. You take advantage of them rather than bemoan them if your expectations are set appropriately. So really you just need to consider how much focus and risk you want to commit and then build a portfolio that works for you. You don't get fear of missing out on things that aren't actually appropriate for your level of engagement and risk tolerance. Then stick to your plan and then in the midst of all that, find a few good sources of information. Um, and uh, if you're listening to this webinar right now, then you are probably uh, already aware of that last point because I try and provide some good information. If you want any more information on the newsletters that I provide, you can visit my website, resourcemaven.ca. And with that, I would like to hand the reins over to Chad, who will take us through the latest in what's going on with Ridgeline Minerals and uh, their portfolio of projects in Nevada. All right, thanks for having me, Gwen. Appreciate it. I like that, uh, I like fundamental value. That was a good, <laughs> like to say we have, uh, we think we have some of that. So um, I'm gonna walk you guys, um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Ridgeline Minerals, I'm gonna give a very quick breakdown on why I think we're uh, doing things a little bit differently than, than some of our peers in Nevada and uh, some of the upside and, and an update on uh, the projects that we're currently drilling right now. So uh, quick cautionary statements. Um, you know, I will have a few few forward-looking statements, but I'll try to keep it to a minimum. So why invest in Ridgeline Minerals? We're a Nevada-focused junior explorer. We have a 116 square kilometer exploration portfolio across three projects in the Carlin and Battle Mountain Eureka Trends of Nevada. So I think going back to what you were saying, Gwen, about having multiple assets in a safe jurisdiction, that's exactly where we are with, uh, with Ridgeline. We have three great projects. They each have their own exciting upside in their own right. And what 2020 is, is a very important year for testing all three of those projects through a phase one, at the minimum of phase one program so that we can try to uh, advance these uh, projects to a decision point for 2021. So um, what really sets us apart, I think, something important to mention is that I co-founded the company with the owner of a drilling company. So, um, you know, our co-founder owns an RC drilling company. We're able to drill at a significant discount to uh, market rates and our peers, which is a huge competitive advantage. Sometimes a great project, the only difference between a discovery and it fading into nothing can be the amount of steel that you get in the ground. And we're able to drill more feet with every uh, more meters with every dollar than uh, than our peers. So we have an experienced management team. We have a lot of skin in the game. We own 17 percent myself uh, included. I own eight percent of the company. So. Uh, I went without a salary for the first 14 months of the company and put 150,000 cash of my own money into every single round, every financing we've had. So we're all firmly aligned. We're out here to make discoveries. And uh, yeah, we're uh, we're really focusing on just completing systematic exploration across all three projects. So um, move into the next slide. Um, okay, so our team, a few things I wanna mention, you know, uh, myself and Mike Harp, we've been a part of over 5 million ounces of discovery uh, in Nevada over the last five, six years. Um, so we know what we're looking for. We both live down here um, and we've surrounded ourselves with a great uh, board and, and team to uh, kind of support what we're doing here in Nevada. So uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Gwen? All right. And from a cap structure perspective, as I mentioned, we have 17% uh, insider ownership, um, really good mix of retail and institutional investors, partners, as well as pub co-partners like EMX Royalty Corp, Vior and Ethos. We have 48 million shares outstanding post IPO in August of 2020, 3.3 million warrants and 6. Point, or 3.3 million options and 6.2 million warrants. So what that leaves us is a very tight share structure with a lot of uh, potential, to, I think, to uh, 
to move up if we have positive uh, expiration results. And we have a cash position of approximately 5.5 million as of uh, the end of August. So we're very well cashed up. We have enough money to complete all of our programs in 2020, as well as fully funded for 2021. So we're in a great position to go out and make a discovery. Uh, why Nevada? I think uh, for most of you, you're probably well aware that it's a world-class jurisdiction. Um, and uh, groups like Barrick, you know, they've they've since done the Nevada Gold Mines joint venture with Newmont and are now doubling down on exploration um, across Nevada. So we think there's still a lot of upside. We founded the company based on exploring for deep exploration targets, and um, you know, we think we're going to have some success. So uh, next slide, slide please, Gwen. Uh, we have three projects as I mentioned: Carlin East, Swift, and Selena. And um, one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, Carlin East and Swift are high-grade underground targets. They're really what we we raised the money on as a company. Um, probably, I think we we introduced the project to Gwen actually about a year ago now. Um, you know, and that was clearly the the what we felt was you know the really huge upside for the company. But we also have a pretty balanced portfolio in that we added the Selena project um, as well, which is a shallow oxide target, and it's starting to show a lot of really exciting results. So. Um, in 20, uh, in, in early 2020, we've completed two programs and we're actually hitting some pretty exciting uh, oxide gold silver. So we believe we're into an emerging discovery there and we're going to be uh, testing both the Swift and Selena targets uh, this fall and we're actually drilling Swift right now. So we'll go into Swift first in the next slide. And what I really want to mention with Swift, I mean, it's a huge land package. It's 51 square kilometers. Um, High-grade target, very little drilling over the last 30 years. It was previously owned by Placer Dome, Barrick, part of the, the Barrick joint venture, or the Cortez joint venture in years past. And uh, we've been able to consolidate the land package. We have 3,000 meters planned for this year, fully approved expiration permit for uh, um, up to five acres of disturbance. And we're only 10 kilometers uh, downtrend of some of the biggest mines in, in Nevada. So if on the next slide, we have... What I really want to point out is on the image to the right, you can see that all of these mines along the Cortez trend, there's over 50 million ounces just scattered in that image alone. Um, they're all clustered along a northwest trend at fault intersections. Well, the next structural block to the north of the pipeline deposit would be the SWIFT project. That would be the next structural intersection. So that's what we're testing right now at the Fallen City target. If you look to the image on the left, it's showing you know very high arsenic, widespread arsenic anomalies across the entire project. There's one historic drill hole in 995A that was drilled in 1999 that hit 17 meters of 0.7 grams per ton gold, and it never got a follow-up hole. Now, for us, when we saw that, that got us really excited because that shows that there's already an active Carlin-type system at depth that de-risks the project significantly without even having to do a drill hole of our own. And what we did is we came in, we reinterpreted the geology, and we're now drilling holes one through three. And I'll show on section AA prime here what has us really excited is that if you look here we drilled we're currently drilling hole number one which is right over here in the fallen city target and what's really exciting for us is we intersected the roberts mountain formation which is one of the key hosts on the cortez trend at 529 meters so that is over 200 meters shallower than the intercept in um uh in hole mck 995a so what it shows us is not only is they're already an active system, but we were able to track it up into much shallower rock. It matched what our geologic model suggested, both with our geophysics and our mapping. And we've hit multiple silica sulfide breaches um, pretty much as soon as we got into lower plate. We've hit multiple breaches between 558 meters and 610 meters. Of course, with any Carlin type system, you gotta take it with a grain of salt, right? It's, it's you don't know whether it's gonna carry gold. Um, that's up to the assay lab because these, it's microscopic gold that we're looking for here. But at the end of the day, we're very excited because we've hit um, the right host rocks. They're altered. And um, we're going to come back in. We're actually uh, we're going to be moving in core rigs um, in the next two weeks. We're going to finish a few more pre-callers at hole two and three. Now, what a pre-caller is, is we drill RC, which with our drilling contract, we can drill for incredibly cheap. We drill that through the white rock, which you can see is our upper plate. And then what we do is we case that hole with steel so the hole doesn't fall apart. And then we follow in with a core tail. The core tail allows us to get very high quality both structural and geochemical data from the hole and it's very trustworthy data so one of the issues with deep drilling in nevada as you get deeper you tend to get below the water table and rc drill holes tend to have a bit of downhole contamination it's different with every project but you always have to kind of take it with a grain of salt right you know that you're hitting altered rock what that gold grade is is really tough to tell until you go in and you confirm it with a drill hole and that's what we're doing now with core is we're going in we're finishing this rc hole right now we'll probably finish it today and then we're going to come back in. We're going to drill about 3,000 meters of core across three to four holes. And um, we're, we're really excited to see what comes out of it. But 
um, I think from an early stage when Gwen was saying, you know, that you know testing your concepts, um, this is a huge uh, a huge win for us, I guess, from the perspective of we came in, reinterpreted the geology, what we've hit now matches what we expected to see. So um, it gives us a lot of confidence with our targeting and heading into uh, to a bigger program. So um, yeah, so I guess next slide. We'll have uh, more information coming from that, by the way. We'll probably have, because we're drilling core, I'd say that our drill results are probably gonna be coming out in mid-November, mid late November. We'll start getting assays coming in. As Gwen mentioned, it's very, very slow at the labs these days, um, but we've actually been lucky enough. Uh, we get about three to four week turnarounds. We have a very good relationship with our lab and, and um, you know, when times were tough, we were still sending samples. So we're getting uh, we're getting priority treatment, which is great. So, so we expect to still get pretty good turnarounds. So I wanna mention the Selena project. Like I said, it's an oxide gold silver target, um, and uh, our phase one and phase three programs highlight that we have significant oxide discovery potential here, and, and we're going to be doing a phase three program starting up about October 20th, and that'll be about a 2,000 meter program to follow up on results from phase two, which we released back in uh, early in late August. So, um, if you don't mind going to the next slide, there, Gwen. So we have multiple uh, targets in here um, on the project. It's 26 square kilometers. And is just to note here, we're right by the Alligator Ridge, Bald Mountain, and Golden Butte mines. So there is active mining in the area, both historic and currently producing. And what we came in with our first uh, phase in the spring, we came in and we trenched across some of these targets. You can look to the image on the right. We trenched up to 38 meters of 0.75, 50 meters of 0.64. And then we drilled with our phase one and two programs beneath those trenches and along strike to try to prove that there was, uh, you know, we could find even stronger mineralization at depth. So if you go to the next slide there, uh, Gwen, we'll show cross-section AA prime here. And we're looking just, this is from our, um, from our press release that we did in, uh, in August. And we intersected oxide gold in 10 of 14 holes in our phase one and two programs. So we had a very high hit rate. Um, holes 13 and 14 were the first holes to actually test this juniper fault, which you can see is kind of the clustering of some of those grades on there. And I'll just mention that, you know, we had up to 29 meters of 1.26 grams per ton gold equivalent which equated, I believe that hole was 29 meters of 0.38 gold and 65 grams silver. So really great silver. We'd like to see the gold getting a little higher, get it up over half a gram, but very, very encouraging results for, for an early stage uh, program like this. I mean, there hadn't been a drill hole on this project for over 20 years. And in our first 15 holes, 1500 meters, we've been able to, I think, show that there's a lot of potential here. So the phase three program, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be testing these parallel structural targets um, across, uh, um, the Tyrant and Maximus faults, and we're actually getting into better host rocks as we head to the west. So the um, brown and the light blue, those are some of the best host rocks in the area. Um, the brown unit hosts the Bald Mountain Mine. What Fremont Gold is drilling right now, just down um, about 40 kilometers to the south, is all in that brown unit. So we have some pretty high hopes for, for testing this target. It also tracks out along one of our better geochem anomalies. So we think we're just starting to vector into some of the higher grade stuff, and we're, we're excited to see what phase three brings. So we'll probably have results for that coming out again in mid-November. Um, so uh, um, we'll get that hopefully going in the next two weeks. So Carlin East is our last um, property. I'd say that probably it's what I raised the majority of our money on when we first founded the company, um, because it is a very core land position, 39 square kilometers directly adjacent to the Gold Strike and Leeville complexes in the North Carlin trend. So um, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you why we're excited. So everything in the gray and white is our property package. And what you can see is in 2019, we drilled hole 1901. We proved that the host rocks were significantly shallower than previously thought. We hit host, uh, lower plate host rocks at 790 meters. Historically, previous operators had thought maybe it was closer to 1500 or 2000 meters deep. So we were able to prove, you know, that was a, a positive move for us last year. And now what we're seeing is, is things are getting very exciting in uh, the North Carlin trend. Barrick is very active drilling, um, and you can see that we have active drills along both margins of uh, the edges of our property here, both along the Leeville corridor and uh, close to the Wren and Banshee deposits. So um, we think there's a lot of upside at Carlin East. It's a very, um, I think it's a quickly evolving story for us. And of course, since we're trying to focus on collecting as much data as possible, keeping them, you know, minimizing risk to our shareholders, we're obviously going to see what comes out of these drill programs, see if anything positive, uh, you know, evolves out of out of barracks drilling, and use that to better target on our own projects. So um, we think that 2021 could be in a very very exciting year for Carlin East, and we'll just uh, hopefully uh, see what comes out of these holes and go from there. So um, next slide, please. So to just to finish off, one thing I really want to mention is we have a lot of catalysts coming up through the end of the fall here. 
Um, we're drilling over 6,000 meters. We've allocated um, all of our drilling towards Salina and Swift for the remainder of the year. That's both a function of timing. Um, we're starting to run out of um, season here. We are gonna get snow probably late November and it makes it difficult to, to complete drilling programs. So we're gonna focus on positive results that we're seeing at Salina. We're already seeing some very exciting rock at Swift and we hope to follow up with some great core drilling and really prove that there's something going on um, there as well. So it'll be, uh, I think November is gonna be really big. We're gonna see results coming in mid-November and probably have that scattering all the way through December um, into early December for the company. So lots of catalysts. Um, we're focused on making a discovery and, um, and yeah, that's what, uh, I think if we go to the next slide, I think the main thing to take away is we're fully funded to complete our activities. Um, we got a great team that uh, knows what they're looking for in Nevada and has had previous success. And, and um, we hope that uh, hope that we can uh, prove that we're uh, the next big thing in Nevada. Thanks, Chad. That was a great run through of things. Um, a few questions have come in. I did forget to specifically remind anyone in the audience, if you have questions, please enter them in the question box. I see them. I'm happy to pass those along uh, right now during our question and answer period. I also have a few questions of my own that I can throw in. Um, so I want to just take a little bit of a step back um, and ask a little bit about building the portfolio of projects that you have. And I think part of the reason for that is uh, that I want to, I'm going to stop showing the screen so people can see us instead, I think. Oh, I hope I that's my webcam was turned off the whole time. So. That's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, building the portfolio. So I talked about, you know, you want to have a team with good technical competence. That's one of the ways to de-risk an exploration bet. And you want to have a um, good technical rationale for the targets on a project and for how a project is sort of how a portfolio was put together. And that's sure. actually one thing that I really liked about Ridgeline right from the beginning. So can you just take us through that about, you know, I mean, Nevada, maybe we'll leave Why Nevada for a moment because I have a bit of a question about that afterwards. But once you got into the decision to focus on Nevada, how did you decide to focus on which kinds of targets? Right, well, fair enough. Um, so it is tough in Nevada, right? Because it's such an endowed state that, you know, no matter where you go, you're probably going to, you're probably going to find a rock that has some gold in it, in Nevada, and it can be really exciting, you know, uh, you know, so when you, I think what we do when we're looking at projects is we're looking for really key structural indicators of, of you don't tend to have multi-million ounce deposits unless it's on a major structural trend. Um, you can get all kinds of half million ounce, million ounce deposits all over Nevada, right? But if you want to find a big guy like what, you know, along the Cortez or the or the North Carlin trend, you have to be on one of these northwest structural trends or and the interstructural intersect, intersections there. So what we were looking for is we really wanted to focus on, we felt the future of exploration in Nevada was going deeper. Um, most of the, you know, the shallow oxide stuff has been pretty picked through and we're really excited about Salina, but we're also very cognizant of the fact that that isn't going to be a 5 million ounce gold mine, right? We know that. I'm not going to go out to shareholders and say it is, but it does have a potential to be, to fall into that half million, million ounce category, which can still be very valuable, right? But um, what we really want to focus the company on is tier one assets. And to find those, you had to go deeper and you have to go into areas where people have already looked, maybe been looking with a bit of um, a different exploration model. And what we were able to do is we went into Carl and East and Swift, which were both considered way too deep. And we, we, we used gravity, we used in the field mapping to actually go in and reinterpret the structural models. And, and we actually have our, we've now proved with our holes at, at Swift that both of those projects are significantly shallower than previously thought. You know, Carlin East was was a you know thousand to a fifteen hundred meter target, and Swift was considered a, an eight hundred to a thousand meter target. We've come in, we hit uh, lower plate at eight hundred meters at Carlin East, and we hit it at five hundred and ninety meters or five hundred and twenty meters, sorry, in uh, Swift. So um, that's well within striking distance for these companies um, in Nevada, you know, Barrick, Dumont, Kinross, and with our drilling contract, it allows us to be even more aggressive with drilling them off. So I think what we really looked for is we thought, okay, it's tough to get a foothold in Nevada. Best way to go about doing that is to going into underexplored or un misunderstood areas, picking that ground up, and then kind of, I think, uh, reinterpreting the story, and that's what we've done. So that was our yeah. first. Gotcha, for sure. Um, so, and uh, for a little bit of context for people, when you talk about the deep targets and the the you know barrack and and what they're drilling and why 
those things are tier one assets. Can you capture a little bit about what Barrick is drilling that's right close to you? Just as an example, um, I think, because not everyone sort of, because we hear about splashy exploration news from junior explorers, but we don't hear as much about splashy exploration news from Barrick, because guess what, they focus on their mind. So get, give us a little rundown of what these guys are actually finding. Yeah, for sure. And like, that's the thing, you know, like some of the results that Barrick is putting out, you know, in the bottom of their Q2 financial reports, every, you know, their, their quarterly financials are the kind of reports that would take other companies to the moon, right, as far as the stock price. And, um, but they're just listing them in the bottom of their, you know, oh, by the way, we actually happen to hit this as well. Um, you know, at, at North Carlin, for example, or in the North Carlin trend near Leeville, um, they are now trusting the Leeville corridor between our two, between Carlin East and the, the existing Leeville mine. And they hit, uh, I believe they released 21 meters of 35 grams per ton you know that's a 735 gt intercept i mean that's that would fall right into you know some of the best intercepts coming out worldwide right and expiration right and that's you know within i think they're within a kilometer of the existing mine infrastructure so i think what it's really highlighting is um you know testing these car these targets along strike and beneath these existing mine sites is having a lot of success barracks doing it right now both at uh, the north carlin trend they're drilling 300 meters i think off of the edge of our boundary on the western edge of our boundary at the ren deposit um so they're looking for the down drop portion of the ren system which already has an established resource up shallower but now they're looking on the other side of the fault zone so um, you know, they're doing that in the North Carlin trend. They're having a lot of success at Four Mile, which is just a long trend of Swift. You know, um, obviously it's a ways down the trend, but it's in the same host rocks. Um, so I think they're probably the most successful group in Nevada um, as far as going in and just testing some of these deeper targets. And when obviously when you have the deep pockets like them, it's, you know, they can be very uh, systematic about it. So we're hoping for for us, we're having to rely heavily on our technical team to to be you know if you have a 50 square kilometer pro project where's your best bet that you're going to have something that's going to show some success and it's a little bit you you probably lose hair doing it i think we, we lose a little hair picking but um you know it's a huge for swift for example you know we hit within where we expect to hit in the model and it's altered which is the most we can hope for right like whether it's going to grade these systems have large alteration halos around them so just the fact that we're in altered rock, I don't know what the grade's going to be, but there is a good chance that it's going to carry grade in some form, whether it's extremely low grade background or or even or higher, right? But what it allows us to do is then factor in, okay, well, now we're hitting, where do we go next? Do we go along strike? Do we go deeper? Do we go to the next parallel fault system? So it's all things that you have to assess as the data comes in. So. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, I've had a couple questions about Carlin East and uh, the decision to not drill there until a little bit later. And I think that ties in with what we were just describing. In, in part, you just said Barrick is drilling 300 meters from your border there. Um, and they can, you know, they have the deep pockets to do some systematic drilling. So I know you've, you and I have chatted about how it's nice to be able to take advantage of some of the work that Barrick's doing. So I think that's part of the answer, right? No, for sure. And, you know, they're de-risking, they're de-risking our projects by, by continuing to drill in the general area because they do release what the results are. We can get a good feel for where they're hitting and, and why they're targeting their targets the way they are. And I think, um, you know, from a budgeting perspective, we budgeted a thousand meters for Carlin East this year, right? Just a quick follow-up program at the end of the year. But I don't want to just put one hole down anymore, right? They're they're having success. We know they're having good hits, like the 21 meters of 35 grams. And I want to be able to put five or six holes into Carlin East next year and make sure that we're actually systematically testing some concepts. And one hole just doesn't do it for us. So we're better served um, sitting back, letting Barrick continue to do, you know, to do exploration. We can learn from what they're doing. And we're better off reallocating that capital to both Swift and Selena, which are showing a lot of very promising um, early stage results. We can then drive Swift and Selena to a bit stronger of a decision point for 2021 as well. So it has benefits on both sides. Yeah, I mean, and, and balancing projects in a portfolio is the challenge and the benefit of having a portfolio of projects, right? Yeah. Um, just one last question on Carlin East before we move on to something else. Someone was saying, you mentioned the two holes that were drilled that hit lower plate at 700 plus meter, meters that showed you that it was shallower than previously expected. What were what, what was assayed for in that rock and what were the results and what, are this, what does it tell you? You bet. Um, so that one, we actually did full multi-element assays on everything. The second hole, uh, 1902, was actually lost at about um, roughly 300 meters in the fault zone that we were targeting. So um, we didn't get into host rocks in that case. And, you know, we only had a million bucks in the bank. Well, and it's quickly disappearing back then in 2019. So we ended up having a hold on on that hole. But one hit lower plate. We drilled about, uh, I think, about... 
50 meters of lower plate before the rig bottomed out in bad ground again again it's very difficult drilling conditions in that area which is part of the reason again why only one hole is a difficult thing to budget for because you may lose that hole halfway down um, but we hit 250 meters of about a half gram silver in the bottom of the hole um, half gram silver ppb level gold um you know anywhere from i think it was about 30 ppm arsenic so um you know anemone was uh, elevated as well so we were seeing elevated trace elements we saw the silver which was higher which showed to us that we felt okay we're in the outer halo of potentially a larger system um we didn't feel that the results that we hit there were hey we're you know we just need to drill 100 feet to the north and we're fine we think that we need to go to the crash zone which is a kilometer to the north that's where all of the geochemistry is really kind of clustering together along with the structural model. So, um, you know, what we saw was, okay, we, we do have lower plate. It is weakly altered, but we're not into the core of the system yet. And so that's what stepping to the north will be. I love the crash zone. That's like the best name for a structural target that I've ever heard. We're pretty, um, boring. We're pretty boring geo. So we just were like, what's happening? Well, everything's crashing together. So why don't we call it the crash zone? <laughs> <laughs> not very original. Um, okay, uh, someone was asking, let's get back to the Nevada um, <clears throat> part of the story. Uh, someone yeah. noted that you are not originally an American, let alone a Nevada in, but are from, you hail from Manitoba, but yet you live down there. Um, mm -hmm. So give me a little bit of your Nevada background and then how, what would you say about the importance of, you know, you and your, you and Mike and your team, like living there in Nevada? Um, what does that give you in terms of connections, knowledge, access to properties, things like that? No, you bet. Um, so I actually started my career in Red Lake, Ontario, working for Premier Gold Mines. So I'm actually had my career was a narrow vein, you know, high grade geo, you know, essentially I worked underground and exploration for like six years. And so I came down to Nevada and had no idea what I was doing. And it took, you know, like it was kind of a hole. But the thing was, is Nevada, I think has a lot of dogma associated with exploration. You know, there's certain rock types you're in and then certain rock types you don't look in. And, and you know, and there for 30 years, there was rock types that had every indication there was gold in them and they didn't get drilled because there was, you know, there was people at the top saying, no, there's no gold there. So when I came down, it was kind of, uh, you know, for us, I just applied my, I guess, my structural background in geology to Nevada geology and, and started testing different concepts that had nothing to do with, you know, oh, there's gold, should be gold here because it's a Triassic age rock or a Devonian, et cetera. And we had success. So we made a discovery at Cove, um, found almost 2 million ounces of 12 grams. It's currently the highest grade undeveloped um, resource not owned by Nevada gold mines in Nevada. So, um, so you know, that was kind of an eye opener for me was that you don't have to be looking in the classic rocks and that's kind of how you know the idea for Ridgeline started and, and Mike Harp's the exact same way I mean he was part of the uh, gold standard team that found almost five million ounces there over the last 10 years and um, you know Mike actually led the discovery of the North Dark Star which was a target that frankly wasn't very well liked by um, previous operators and stuff because there wasn't a good enough geochemistry anomaly but Mike applied a different structural approach to it and they made a discovery so um, I think having an open mind and trying different concepts in Nevada is starting to bear fruit for majors and juniors like us. So, And then what about living down there? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, um, yeah um, living down here, we've been down here for eight years. I have a green card now. My, uh, you know, my wife and I moved down in 2012 and we got two kids and a dog and a cat and we're pretty entrenched now. So, um, but living in Nevada is huge because what we get is, you know, I have prospectors, um, different landowners that I catch up with for a beer every once in a while right and they just say hey by the way I staked this new ground come take a look and that's how um, we got to know the EMX team actually through kind of a relationship that way which led to lead spinning these projects out and I'm currently assessing multiple opportunities in Nevada um, for additional projects to bring into the portfolio right now that I would say probably are not um, you know groups out of like Vancouver or Toronto it is flat out they're not going to get access to these projects right because we're able to go out look at them and two days instead of two months and um, we can make a decision pretty quick. So it's been a huge, huge advantage. All right. Um, a money question. You have enough money clearly for this year. Do you have a concept at this point of when you might need to raise money uh, to further to get through 2021 or does, is it too dependent on results or what, what, what do you say to that? Here, our cash burns quite low. Uh, so even with all the drilling we're doing this fall, we're going to end the year with about four point five four point four million Canadian in the bank um, so that would be more than enough to do another eight probably about an eight thousand meter program next year as well as well as cover all of our overhead but um, realistically I would say fall of 2021 to fall of 2021 if uh, you know if we're having some success um, we'd probably be looking at raising now if we have some success this fall 
and the stock performs well, then we can, you know, raise an evaluation that uh, we like, then we'd absolutely look at adding to the treasury before the end of the year even, but it really just comes down to draw results. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, and then just to finish, um, let's return to this, this the move that you made at Swift to change from RC drilling to core drilling. Um, let's just, yeah, let's just, I think that's kind of an interesting, it's a pretty interesting decision. Uh, so let's just talk about that again, because we all know we need to hear things more than once before we understand them as people in general. Um, so yeah, I just want you to revisit that and uh, and give us that overview one more time. Well, it wasn't it wasn't an easy choice because obviously we have the drilling contract that's RC, right? So our our drilling contractor only has RC rigs. That's where we get our massive dis discount to uh, to our peers. But the issue is, is when you're drilling deep holes in Nevada um, and you have groundwater, the mix of those two can be problematic for RC. So if you're drilling RC shallow like we do at Salina, we don't have any groundwater there. So I have 100% confidence that what we're drilling, um, the assays, etc., we're not getting any smearing of grades. It's all very, very quality data. When you get 2,000 feet down and you're below the water table, you just the fines. There's the whole carlin type systems are just fine gold kind of uh flitting through, you know just disseminated throughout the rock right so when you start smushing that rock apart and breaking it apart with a rc rig and you have groundwater all of those fines trickle down the hole and so you can end up with you know an intercept you know let's just say hypothetically you had 10 meters of 10 grams in an rc hole you could then drill a core hole and that might actually be four meters of 15 grams typically you will have a narrower intercept that is higher grade with a core hole and it's obviously representative exactly what you're drilling right so for us what we're seeing in the hole is exciting enough there's enough alteration that we need to have core to get that um you know we need to be able to get that full picture to be able to make better decisions for uh for future drilling programs going into 2021 so for us it's it's pretty exciting um it's worth spending the money because uh we're hitting the right looking stuff so you heard it here first that's cool that's exciting stuff for sure um well, I think it's been almost an hour. Uh, I'm always aware of taking up people's time. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Chad, is there anything else you wanted to uh, wanted to say before we before we sign off? I think we covered a lot of it, but if anyone has any more interest in, in kind of checking out each of the projects, we have Verify models for all three projects on our website at ridgelineminerals.com. We're constantly on Twitter, bothering all of our followers and, and uh, LinkedIn as well, so with updates and stuff. So if you're interested in learning more about the company, subscribe to our list. Um, follow us on Twitter and all that. We'll be keeping uh, regular updates heading through the fall, but I'm um, going to be a lot of news coming out through late October all the way through December. So it should be exciting. Perfect. Well, thanks for uh, for the presentation and the questions and answers today here, Chad. And of course, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, we appreciate your interest. If you have, as Chad said, if you have any questions for him or any questions for me, we are both very easy to find at our websites. Um, and with that, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everyone, for your interest. And we will see you here again soon, I'm sure. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.